<laughs> Music to die for. <laughs> hey guys, Ken Tamplin from Ken Tampa Vocal Academy here. And uh, on this Halloween day, I decided to do something called Music to Die For. Now, uh, this is quite serious to some, maybe not as serious to others, but it begs the question, should we have an accountability for music that we produce as artists, music artists, particularly in the lyric department? And exactly what is that accountability? Now, uh, I'm not looking to get too heavy on anybody, but I think there's some subject matter here um, would be interesting to cover. That's why I called it Music to Die For. I am aware that there is a lot of interest in Friday the 13th movies and Jason. Um, you could have everything from snuff films to vampire films. People just like to be scared. They like the macabre. They're you know intrigued with death and you know suicide bridges all over the world. You look it up on YouTube and you see how many places people romance you know the other side, so to speak, the dark side, the other side. And it's creepy and weird and it gives you the chills and whatnot. But um, there are a couple things here that I wanted to discuss and it doesn't mean that if you watch a Romeo and Juliet movie that everyone wants to run out and kill themselves. That's not the point. Nor is it if you watch a Friday the 13th movie you're going to go out and commit the acts in the movie that you saw. People just like to be scared. But at what, what point is there culpability or at what point do we sort of draw the line and say, you know, hey, we should really take into consideration that as artists, especially if you are an artist, um, at what point do we uh, really take responsibility for our lyrics and what it is that we do? Now, I'm not here to make fun of these bands or call them out in the same kind of way. In fact, I want you to decide and I want you to put in the comment sections what you think about what I'm saying. Now, I believe in freedom of speech. I believe in freedom of expression. Uh, only to the extent that it's not directly affecting someone else that could cost them dearly, okay? Um, I want to start out with um, the band Slayer. Now, back in the 90s, you guys may or may not remember this, they were blamed for the murder of a 15-year-old girl. And uh, the 15-year-old girl was um, Elise Poller. I don't know if that's how you say her name, Poller. Uh, she's a pretty young girl, uh, and she had her entire life ahead of her. And of course, they were. she was lured by three young Satanists. Now, these guys, uh, Royce Casey, uh, Jacob uh, Delushma, and Joseph Fiorella, um, they actually went on to cut her life short. And I don't want to go into the grisly, gruesome details so much of a lot of this stuff, uh, but they were so, they said they were so inspired by Slayer's music um, that they started their own band called Hatred. Now, as you guys may or may not know, I, by the way, I, I, I've, um, I don't say had the privilege, but uh, I've had a lot of rehearsal rooms in LA. Uh, could be SI or recording. It could have been Mates recording. It could have been a lot of different places where um, some of these bands have actually rehearsed right next to us and they held their seances and their weird, creepy things that they did. So I'm aware that these guys really did do stuff like this. Um, so it's not make believe, it, it's actually happened. But I want to go on and I want to read a couple things. It says, while the boys practiced their metal songs, they were devised different ways to kill Elise. Eventually, they settled on an idea of luring Elise from her home with a promise of free drugs. Once alone with her, they intended to strangle, stab, and rape her. Sadly, that's exactly what happened to Elise on July 22nd of 1995. Now, I don't want to go into, like I said, the gross details. You guys are welcome to look it up, but it is pretty gnarly. Um, but I did want to talk about you know, the lyrics to the song and how they could have got there. And is there a responsibility that we should have where it's not just as simple as putting out a Friday the 13th movie, us getting the chills, thinking about the macabre, laugh it off and move on. Because as she was stabbed, the stab wounds themselves didn't kill her. It was actually she bled to death, which is horrible. Um, and then they, you know, um, Royce Casey took the authorities to where her body was. They found a decomposed body out in the forest where they did this stuff. And then the, uh, the boys, particularly Fiorella, told the, proba um, the probation officer that he'd been influenced by Slayer's music heavily and that Slayer's album contained ly lyrics about sacrificing virgins and the devil and so forth. And he sort of blamed Slayer. Now, I'm not here to blame Slayer, but... I do want to call up the song. I want to read the lyric real quick. And then I want to call up the song and then you could sort of extrapolate the lyric out of the song. It says, mortuaries, dead of night, my body starts to rise. In my mind, the horror lives to feel death deep inside. Relentless lust of rotting flesh. She was rotting in the forest, ironically. To thrash the tomb she lies. Um, heathen whore of Satan's wrath, I spit at your demise. 
Virgin child now drained of life. That's exactly what happened. She bled to this. She didn't die by the stab wounds. Your soul cannot be free, not giving the chance to rot in hell. Satan's cross points to hell, the earth I must uncover. A passion grows to feast upon the frozen blood inside of her. I feel the urge, the growing need to F this sinful corpse. That's exactly what they did. They had sex with her after they, they stabbed her, tried to stab her to death. Uh, my task complete, the bitch's soul lies raped in demonic lust. And it goes on. I mean, it's a really, really foul, gnarly lyrics. So is there a culpability? Should there be a culpability to this? I would say yes. I mean, let, let's play the song. Let's check it out here. Most will Okay, so I mean, in there, you know, I didn't play all the song, but that's sort of the gist of it. Now, another one is Judas Priest uh, being blamed for suicides. And, and again, I'm not, I mean, I like Judas Priest. They're a great band, right? They're great performers live, etc. cetera. Um, but there was a Judas Priest song that was called out. And some of you may know that, um, the album Steam Glass. Uh, Belt Nap um, actually succumbed to some injuries. It was a pretty horrible situation. I'm not gonna go into too much of the detail on it, but there was a, um, you know, a suicide that was blamed. Um, and the name of the song, and I'm just going to quote the parents, it says, The parents of the boys were convinced that the album contained subliminal messages that influences the boys to shoot themselves, two, two boys shot themselves, better you, better than me, was fingered as the song which contained the subliminal messages and drove the boys to their heinous act. The event took place on December 23rd, 1985, which would result in a sensationalistic trial in which the boys' parents would try to sue Judas Priest for 6.2 million bucks. Well... By the way, it's kind of weird too because the parents suing for whatever amount of money, I think you would be suing to try to stop this from happening, not going after some sort of monetary thing. So I'm not even sure how altruistic, altruistic. I'm not sure how you know this played out. But what I do know is I just want to read the lyrics to you because they they seem somewhat innocuous to me. They don't seem as as gnarly as the as the Slayer lyrics. But let me read it. Uh, everybody knows, everybody knows, better you, better than me. Uh, you can tell what I want it to be. You can say what I, uh, what I can only see. It's better by you than better by me. Guess I'll have to change my way of living. Don't want to really know the way I feel. Uh, guess I learned to fight and kill. Tell her not to wait until they'll find my blood upon her windowsill. It's better than you, better than me. It's just gore. It's like, I, you know, like I said, that leans a little bit more to me along the uh, along the lines of, you know, like a Jason film, a Friday the 13th film or something. But let's just take a quick listen here. I have to change my way of living. Okay, so I bring that up because it's kind of kind of a cool guitar lick. It reminds me of something from the late 70s, kind of a groove, whatever. And there were a lot of bands. I mean, I don't know if you remember a, a song called Dead on Arrival, you know? And I guess apparently what happened to the guy that wrote the song Dead on Arrival, the exact thing happened to him in real life later, you know, just, I don't say coincidentally, but you know, whatever. I don't know, guys, you know, that, that's, that's kind of a little bit on the you know, fringe for me. But anyway, uh, Denver's Lincoln Park Strangler blames violent music for crime. So Richard Paul White is one of Colorado's most notorious killers. He was confessed of killing six people, but only three have been confirmed. Um, uh, Anna Lechia Maria Gonzalez, 27, Victoria Lynn Turpin, 32, and Jason Reichart, 27, who is a former co-worker of his. He'd been dubbed Denver's Lincoln Park Strangler following the confession from his jail that I would listen to Lincoln Park before I would kill, he said. And while I was, while I was killing, I would be listening to Lincoln Park. Well, that's putting a lot of um, pressure on Lincoln Park, if you ask me. I, I've listened to a lot of their lyrics. You know, to me, they had a lot of really interesting lyrics. I know they talked about a lot of depression, suicide, some other things, but I don't think you can extrapolate that all the way from that lyric that you're listening to someone else's struggle and then, you know, um, blame them, so to speak, for, you know, your atrocities. So, um, again, weigh in on this. You guys tell me what you think um, in the comments section. So, I'm not, you know, here calling Lincoln Park. I mean, 
they're actually a really good band and, and they're really great live. Anyway, so the six foot, uh, t uh, six foot tall redheaded serious killer uh, must have been horrifying to see uh, as he cr cruelly and maliciously. By the way, he also said that Metallica was one of his biggest influences too. So what do you call Metallica into this as well? I don't know. Anyway, Leroy Smith III says the band Slayer held a gun to his head. During May, 14th of, um, during May of 2014, Leroy H. Smith III killed and dismembered his father, 56-year-old Le um, Leroy Smith Jr., in their Conard Street apartment uh, located in Maine. Leroy said to the authorities that he stabbed his father in the head and neck, and after murdering his father, he cut him into pieces and placed his body and parts in trash bags. He was initially deemed mentally incompetent and placed in a physical, a psychiatric facility. So, you know, okay, so you've got, and then he said later, um, Leroy injected, or interjected during court proceedings, started speaking of an incident that he claims took place between himself and the band Slayer, and he claims that I had a gun held him against my head and sworn to keep secret about what I am. They refused to investigate the person's responsible. If you have someone that is mentally ill and confessedly mentally ill and clinically mentally ill, I don't know how you could blame a band for that. Now, but the band should have a responsibility to some degree. Where do we draw the line? I'm asking you guys the question. I'm not here to be the arbiter of truth here or anyone's judge, but I am saying like, where do we draw the line of something that's going to, you know, possibly engage someone else in an act that could be this heinous? Anyway, I don't want to go into the more of the details of the black metal band Mayhem linked to arson and murder. So you guys can look this one up. This one is really disturbing because if you go back here, it says the original lead singer committed suicide by slitting his wrist, shooting himself in the face. His body was discovered by bandmate uh, Euronymous who took pictures of it and then used the pictures as the band's album cover for the dawn of the Blackhearts. Well, that's pretty gnarly, guys. So you guy, your, your bandmate guy kills himself and you're gonna use the photos as your band, your, you know, your album cover? That's pretty weird. To take things further, uh, Aronimus uh, then did the unthinkable and fashioned a necklace out of his bandmate's skull fragments. Well, if you're just looking to be as sick and demented and disturbed as possible, I guess that would be one way to do it. And so is this where we draw the line? Like, is this, you know, I'd love to sit here and try to make light of some of this stuff, but I just can't because it, it is so gnarly and so gruesome um, and, and, and bizarre. But anyway, and you could go in and he talks more about the group and, and horrible things that the band did. Here's another one. Two San Bernardino kids listened to Slipknot before and after killing their friend. 16-year-old Amber Rose Riley and 22-year-old Jason Lamar Harris brutally murdered Terry Ray Taylor by flat slashing his throat and stabbing him more than 20 times. And it goes on to talk about uh, how Riley and Harris lured the unsuspecting Terry Ray Taylor to Paris Hill in San Bernardino. Um, as the trio sat beneath a pepper tree listening to a Slipknot album, Riley signaled to her boyfriend to stab Taylor. Following the murder, the two continued to listen to the Slipknot album. So, I mean, that's pretty freaking creepy and weird, if you ask me. But it begs the question, and I want to go on because there's an Eminem impersonator. He kills a law student based on a... Um, I think it was based on him impersonating Eminem and then a boy kills girlfriend to imitate Marilyn Manson's painting. I mean, there's a lot of this stuff, but I want to just stop at the Slipknot piece because Slipknot, let's just read the lyric and you guys can decide with me. Now, I am not here to judge bands or this, that. I'm here to put it out there saying music to die for. Is this worth dying for? And is this something that we should, um, you know, take seriously as artists, right? Anyway, and I know everyone's trying to be more evil and more dark and more Satanist and let's get, let's see how, uh, how extreme we could be. Back in the shock rock days, you know, you had Alice Cooper stabbing baby dolls with small steely knives. He had a, a guillotine on stage. He put a boa constrictor around his neck. He bit the head of a chicken off. Then Ozzy come and think him and followed it up with biting a bass head off. And everyone's trying to do something more sensationalistic and extreme. Well, this is uh, maybe taking it a little too far, but let's read these lyrics here. So. Nobody stop me. I want to slit your throat and F the wound. He says it. Want to push my face and feel the swoon. Want to dig inside, find a little bit of me because the line gets crossed when you don't come clean. My wormwood meets your pesticide. You'll never get out because you were never alive. I'm an infinite or I'm infinite. I'm the infinite finite, whatever that means. Um, come a little closer and I'll show you why no one is safe. Noises, noises. People make noises. People make noises when they're sick. Nothing to do except hold on to nothing. No one is safe. Noises, noises. People make noises, blah, blah, blah. Um, that never had a chance of being realized. What the F are you looking at? I tell you what you're looking at. Everyone you've ever effing laughed at. Look in my eyes for the answers. Typical. I can feel it. 
underneath like a miracle. Everybody in the world needs more than lies and consequences to power them once again. It's me and no one else. I can remember if there was someone else. It's not mine, it's not fair. It's out of my hands, it's shaking. Uh, you'll never take me, no one is safe, no one then goes on, whatever. So they're kind of ambiguous, if you ask me, except for some of the foul language and slitting your throat and effing the wound. Uh, it just sounds like a real, the most extreme version of an anger sort of statement. But let's take a listen to the song, you can decide, here it is. <laughs> gnarly. I mean, those are some gnarly lyrics. Guys, at what point are we responsible for our actions? Do we just do things and blame it and say, oh, you know, it's my art. I could do what I want. I have freedom of speech. I'm all for freedom of speech, but not to the, to the uh, extent that it affects someone else that could be taking their life or doing something crazy or taking someone else's life. life. But also, I don't think it's fair to blame disturbed people that have, you know, could they have gone to a, a, you know, a Friday the 13th film or could they have read Romeo and Juliet and taken their life or taken someone else's? You know, I don't know to what extreme, but it is a question that needs to be answered. Is it music worth dying for? Let me know your thoughts. Please put your thoughts and comments in there in the comment sections. I welcome that. And uh, let me know what you think. All right. Until next time. Peace out.